<clears throat> so Preston, it's great to have you on the show. Um, great lover of the uh, part of the world that you're in, Austin, Texas. And I, I think your topic around spirituality and, and money is a timely one. It's a useful one and, and one that I would love to kind of get into. Before I um, hear about your, um, your perspective on this, I want to ask you, like, it's an interesting kind of um, take about money bringing in spirituality. And as you know, you know, sometimes contrast and situations in life are those that teach you the most. You know, you get a wonderful lesson that comes from it and kind of go, oh, my gosh, I think I'm going to head in this direction. Um, and while we may not necessarily relish the, the, the contrast, the, the, you know, the, the setback, it teaches us sometimes more than our successes do. So I'm just curious, um, was there something in your life that happened that triggered you on this path around, you know, spiritual millionaires and, and merging money and, and spirituality together? Like what happened? What set that off for you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, there's so many things that I set bet. that off. Um, I'll go with... Um, and by the way, I love the, the title of the show because it's very true for me, right? Like uh, 10 years ago, I was a surf instructor in uh, Venice Beach, California. And today, even right now, I'm sitting in one of six homes that I own. There's three on this property and then I own another five. Um, and and uh, I have all the toys and it's a giant compound. And, and, and like to go from, you know, making $30,000 a year giving my gifts and 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 love being a lover of the ocean and a lover of spirituality and and being attuned and to to where I'm experiencing life from now uh, I think it's my duty actually to speak to those who are spiritually inclined and remind them of what is possible and that there's no place where God isn't now we can say no place where the universe isn't, no place where Buddha isn't, no place where Jesus isn't, but there's no borders, right? And so um, what I'm essentially teaching and living is, uh, I'll give you a quote. One of my favorite quotes in the world comes from the Gnostic Gospels of Thomas, and it reads, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. But if mm. you do not bring forth, what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. Mm. Now, in essence, that is happening min minute by minute, moment by moment, and in, in the macro stance, right? I, I say it differently. The, the, the fruit doesn't belong to the tree. It belongs to the ecosystem. And so if, if, if the fruit, if the tree tries to hold on to the fruit, it stagnates and dies. And so as we make room for our gifts and we are um, faithful stewards to those gifts and we give them out, and, and don't place value judgments on things or deify, you know, a lot of times, period, people deify money and materials and, and, and they, they, they lower uh, moments like this morning, I walked out and the cicadas uh, were singing in the trees and then the butterflies and the dragonflies and everybody starts coming out and I take those moments. I'm like, yo, this is just as beautiful as, you know, everything else that's occurring in my life and allowing myself to be moved by them. And so I'll say this, um, my whole life, and I'm just going to give you the cl cliff notes here. Uh, I've, I've been led by intuition. Um, one of the first times was uh, I said no to going out and hanging out with my friends, my best friends, because I had a, I couldn't even spell intuition. I was 15. But um, something said, don't go. And I didn't. And everybody in that car was shot and killed. Everyone. Um, or, or no, Scott was shot in the head and killed. Everybody in the blue Astro van was shot. So I would have been shot no matter what. The question is, what I would have been shot in the head like him. So my best friend died at 15. And that voice that told me not to go, um, it never stopped. And it hasn't. Like, it, like I'll give you another crazy one. I got a hit. That voice popped up and said, you're going to meet your wife soon. And I went on Instagram and I put up this post uh, of two wolves kissing. And I had no clue who it was. And I said, I can feel her coming. 
dash, hashtag wifey, hashtag the queen is on her way. That night, I went on a blind date, and I wasn't going to go on the blind date, but the voice said, go. And I'm like, are you serious, bro? Like, you know, I'm, you know, fighting with this voice that's always been there. And it said, go. And I said, but it's not her. This isn't, I don't want to marry this woman. I, this isn't it. And the voice said, go. Every red light on the way to this show, we hit. And we get to the show. They say, we oversold the show by 10 seats. You can give your money back or you can come tomorrow. Or you can come stand on the wall. My date says, let's stand on the wall. We walk in. Uh, the gentleman puts us on the wall. It's packed. And we're, the stage is right there. And he takes two steps. And as if a lightning bolt hit him, he turns back around and he says, actually, you two, come here. Now, everybody else on the wall should have gotten what he did for us. But for some reason, he chose us. So he brought us, he said, this is a fire hazard, but I'm going to add two more seats to the front row. And he put the seats down and I sat here and my date sat there. And right next to my date was my wife. And I knew it instantly. Mm -hmm. Now I have like 10 of those that were earth shattering, groundbreaking, life altering moments. And then like 50 million that are seemingly insignificant, but I just listen. I'm, I'm faithful right. to the voice. So I love those stories and I'm sure you have many more and I've got mine mm -hmm. as well, but how did you then transition or how did the, the emphasis on merging or combining, I suppose that's not even the right thing because they are the one and the same, mm -hmm. the financial aspect of one's material life, which is we're here in this plane, here in this level, here in this vibration, here in this, you know, step of life, you know, the physical versus the spiritual. And you're sort of like, you're bringing together the, you know, the, the the physical meaning of the, the the financial aspect of you know this is part of what we do in this world in order to uh, provide for ourselves and our families but i gather i gather that you you are sort of finding a way to say that they are the one and the same that they, they are, that there's no the spirituality and, and financial abundance is no different than you know um two parts of the body it's all part of the same you know and I, uh, I had this wonderful client of mine just a couple of days ago, we were talking about her, her book and she was meditating on that particular process. And she said, one of the things that came out of that conversation was this quote, and I wrote it down because I thought it was so wonderful is that she said, what I am seeking is seeking me. That. And I love that. And it really reflects kind of your story about your wife that you found and the path that you're on, that it's also looking for you, not only you looking for it. There's a, there's a sense of familiarity, a family. Correct. When you, because, when you finally, yeah. Because everything is reaching towards the sun, right? Everything wants to uh, be imbued and expressed and experienced everything. So all material, including the money that, uh, you know, that we walk by the tree and we say nothing. We, we shave the tree down, nothing, no value. Then we print this green stuff on that same paper and we go, oh, it's, it's so valuable. Right. right. <laughs> now, all of it, right? That jacket, which is epic and looks really good on you, was always yours. It was yours 40 years ago. Because mm. what you want wants you. What you seek is seeking you and everything wants to be expressed, experienced, and loved on. And so our job in the uh, manifestation process is to say yes to our yes and to mm -hmm. get that there's no distinction between the ant and the elephant. In the eyes of God and consciousness, an ant and an elephant are the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. But we as the humans walk around looking for elephant moments. Oh, it's, it's, it's when, it's when I get the car, when I get the, 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 the promotion, when I get the partner, then, right? while right. we miss all the ant moments, because it's all relative. Yeah. Everything is actually beautiful. If you look far enough, if you take the, 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 the global view of it, and I explain this, uh, this, I guess, metaphor of, you know, if in this room that I'm sitting in right now, there was an ant down there, let's say to the left, and uh, let's say I drop some cookies right here to my right. And the ant sensed 
It couldn't see with its own eyes, but it sensed that there was food for it. Hmm. To the ant, the cookies are in the future. But to me, standing above, the cookies and the ant are in the now. Now that's true for every single one of us. The difference is, is how do you take the journey from what you are sensing to the thing? Because an unhappy journey will never produce a happy ending. And, and right. that's, to me, the biggest work we all have to do here is to get that all these materials, including the paper that money is printed on, is meaningless unless we give it meaning. And we can imbue everything. You know, I have clients all the time. They're like, I'm just bad with money. And I'm like, okay, so um, where do you live? Oh, I live in Ojai. Okay, a house or apartment? Apartment. Okay, awesome. How young are you? Oh, I'm 55. Okay, so for 55 years, have you ever slept on the streets? Well, no. For 55 years, uh, let's call it 40 years. For 40 years, has your mortgage or rent ever not been paid? Well, no. Okay, for the last 30 years, have you never had water, food, entertainment? Well, no, and we'll just keep going, and I'll get to the point where I say, okay, so let's just gather all that up. About how much money do you think has passed through your space in the 40-something years? It's millions and millions and millions. For sure. So your story that you're bad with money is actually just a mental construct because all your needs have always been met. You've never had a moment where your needs have not been met. The, the, the difference is, is that you're not operating from it. And the, 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 it's not luck, it's law. It's not personal, it's principle. And so mm -hmm. the, the law does not give one crap. It says, oh, you'd like to experience that? Awesome, here's more. Which could be anything. It could be abundance or it could be the lack of abundance. Correct. I Correct. remember once I, there was a video of me taking, uh, of doing a, a facilitation and I thought it went pretty well. And I looked at it recently and I was saying something that, you know, when I say stuff, I don't know about you, I forget it. You know, it's, it's sort of, I feel more like a conduit than mm -hmm. um, a library, you know, um, and it's, it's wonderful. And yet it's sort of, hard to keep track of all this stuff, you know, after 30 years of all these ideas and they come and they go, right. They, and so anyway, one of them got captured on, on this video and I thought, Hmm, that's not bad. And it was basically saying that all the drama that we see out in the world, like a TV screen, like we're watching with a clicker is really just a reflection of the drama that's taking place with inside of us. They are one and the same, but we somehow feel, victimized, justified, whatever the word might be to, um, to, to give label to why this drama is not us. Yes. And in fact, it is us. It is the same sort of, see, it's like the same thing with the food and the ant, you know, it, it's, yes. it's the, it's the ant and the elephant and it's, and it's all connected. That. I love this. I love this conversation. I think this is yes. fantastic. How it, so I have two thoughts. One is how do you, operationalize this philosophy for your yes. clients? How do yes. you get them from this 55 year old person? And you started around, I don't feel like I'm very good with money. And I gather a lot of this has to do with shifting their mindset to a one of abundance. But what is that partly? What does that look like for you? What, what's your process to be able to, yeah. obviously the biggest process is you have to live and act in accordance to your beliefs. And so you are a wonderful ambassador for this philosophy because you live it. So people are attracted to you because of that. But aside from that, what yes. else do you do? Well, yeah, well, one of my biggest philosophies is, you know, we're threefold beings, body, mind, and soul. And um, uh, especially in the new age, new thought community and, and in this sort of space that we have now, everybody's trying to do it through mindset work. And mindset mm. work is awesome, but it's if the body... If you haven't built a somatic body that can hold what you say you want and then some, it will mm. never stick, right? So um, I, I give the example uh, to me, God, uh, spirit, divine intelligence is like electricity, right? Electricity says, um, 
you can plug up your iPhone, you can plug up a computer, you can plug up a Tesla, or you can plug up a city. The only question I have for you is, do you have the infrastructure to hold it? That's mm -hmm. it. And so when I'm working with somebody, it's helping them build the infrastructure to hold what their mind says they want. Now, ultimately, we can't take any of it with us. And my truth is that we, you know, in this whole death thing, it's, it's like here and now in the body and here and now out of the body, right? When I'm here and now out of the body, I will be able to fly and do whatever I want. When I'm here and now in the body, there is limited things that I can do and say in X, Y, and Z. And so while we're here, I'm going to use the materials on this beautiful green earth because that's what those materials want. The plants want to be seen. The cars want to be driven. They are they, all of it, right? I'm sitting in this house. This house was built in 2006, I believe. They didn't know they were building it for me too, hmm. but it's mine, right? Same thing in that room. Whoever built that house or place you're in, they built it for you too. And so all yeah. we're doing is stewarding everything, everything. Mm -hmm. We don't get to bring it into the grave with us, right? It is going to someone else. And so while we're here, I don't um, deify or demonize anything, anything. This, my kids got this from Goodwill. This is a $5 shirt. And just on the other side of this computer is a $100,000 car. And right there is a $200,000 one. And all of it is exactly the same to me. And people do it all. They come over and they're like, why are you so generous with all this stuff? Because it's, it's just materials. Mm -hmm. That's not my God, right? So, so I help people, A, um, reconfigure their nervous system to hold more abundance. And then I put them on challenges to notice and count their blessings and actually feel it. So I give my clients this day one. Anytime I work with somebody, first thing we do is I have them set three to five alarms in their phone. And these are called joy alarms. And every time the alarm goes off, you burst into reasonless joy. And it must be body. You must use vocals. And you have to be as big as possible. Three to five times a day. Alarm goes off, reasonless joy. Alarm goes off. Reasonless joy. What we're doing is we're building a somatic body that where, the, where, the, where um, we are uh, attuning to the frequency and the vibration of our, the truth of our being and getting back to a homeostasis that is uh, like we were as children before we were um, traumatized and bought into the weapons of mass distraction and the, 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 the BS mm that we inherited. So that's some of what I do, but it's, it's, it's pretty deep and beautiful and intricate and I make it fun. Are you able to apply this in corporate settings? And if so, how? Yes, absolutely. Cause corporate settings, everything, everything that is done anywhere is done um, with humans. We're social beings, social beings born into beliefs and interpretations. Whether it is inside of a building that has a corporation, corporation's name on it, or it's outside of the building, it's still humans in that thing. And so I've gone into some pretty big corporations that I cannot pers name because I signed NDAs uh, sure. about those things, um, banks and things of that nature. And I'll help them extract and look at what the culture is doing. How are these people actually feeling when they're at work? What discharged energy is still living in their bodies? Because the body's a living library that stores everything. And so if you free the body, you actually free everything else. Because the soul, the soul knows. The soul's done. The soul's got it figured out and always has. The mind can have its own conversation. And the body, which has more than likely a lot of unprocessed trauma and shame in it, is the key. Right? I can tell you I'm going to do this till the cows come home. But if my body's not on board, we're not going anywhere. And so right. I'll go do uh, what we call somatic experiential workshops inside of corporations and help their clients get free -er. and with all that energetic real estate, they now have a happier, more present um, uh, employee and, and they love each other because they're now connected because they understand, ah, this person was molested when they were nine. This person didn't have a dad. 
this person, you know, we go into the depths of things. And mm -hmm. what happens is you be begin to love your coworkers because you see them differently. Now you get, mm -hmm. oh, we're the same, right? Tammy's a beep because of the other stuff that I didn't know was going on when her husband was beating her or whatever the case may be. And so uh, that's some of how I would do it. That's fantastic. And what are the other two or three, uh, I guess, mentors, uh, mm -hmm. authors, um, spiritual practices that you would count as being part of your own philosophy that aided mm -hmm. you in your in your development? And which yes. ones are they? So Michael Beckwith is a huge influence. Uh, he's a friend. He married my wife and I. Um, he has a spiritual center called Agape International in Los Angeles. He uh, mm. was on The Secret. Um, and mm. um, there's another gentleman who just died four days ago, a mentor of mine named Scott Cody, who uh, was he had a uh, embodiment uh, leadership um, program, nine month program that I did. Uh, he would do work with NASA and leadership stuff in some of the biggest places in the world. Um, and he mentored me for many years. Um, he just passed away from cancer. And mm. uh, nature. Nature is one of my nature. biggest Nature. Yes. Yes. Getting Where do you out. like to go? Um, anywhere outside, anywhere in the... Um, I'm, I'm definitely an ocean person. Like, uh, obviously, I was a surf instructor. But, and you live uh, in Texas. <laughs> I live in Texas, exactly. So, so I, uh, I'll, I'll get into the woods. I actually live on four acres, and it's a lot. It's thousands of trees and bugs and snakes, and it's on a, a creek bed. And so I'll go in the creek and sit there and just listen and learn huh. and remember. Yeah, that's great. Well, tell us a little bit about Preston, your business, your book, and how people can connect with you. Yeah, I have a new book uh, that's you know, out, should be out now, whoever's watching this and listening to it, uh, called Spiritual Millionaire. Uh, it's at PrestonSmiles.com forward slash book. Um, it is unlock, unlocking the seven inner laws of abundance and money. And mm. it's, it's deep, it's powerful, um, and some of my best work. And I also have a uh, nervous system workshop that I do with my wife. I've been doing it for 10 years. Uh, all over the world called the bridge experience and it's like a heart surgery it's a experiential workshop that helps people free themselves and so those are two of my main focuses right now uh, i have clients and coaching programs and i have a tech company that uh, can build anything in under an hour uh, as far as websites and all that stuff and so uh, I got my hands full, four kids, yeah. <laughs> one wife, a bunch of houses, all the things. And uh, it's been interesting, man. And and I, I just want to, Dean, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to you. Um, I'm sure your listeners know, but I'm going to remind them that there's a whole bunch of work you had to do to, to be able to hold something like this. And uh, a lot of times we don't see that part. And I just want to acknowledge mm -hmm. you as somebody who who's been in this space for a very long time, right? Um, that I see it and you shine bright and it's beautiful, the work that you're doing and, and what you're giving to people. You're very generous, Preston. That's very kind of you to say, and you're right. There is a lot of behind the scenes work to put anything off. Um, mm -hmm. But without further ado on that, I, I accept your, your compliment and thank you very much. And you're, you're just such a, a shining light. I mean, I love it. It smiles. You're, your given name? Were you born with smiles? Is that your last name? I was not. I was not. It just I, seems I, like it, it, it fits you so well, like going back to like, you know, maybe I need to change my last name because it doesn't seem to align with who I am. But is, <laughs> what was your, when we were born, what were you called? Uh, Preston Davis. Uh, Preston Davis. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And when did you change your name to Preston Smiles? I think I was 21 or, tw tw no, no, I was 25 uh, when I changed it. Um, yeah, it was one of those interesting moments. Uh, I got an MFA in theater from Louisiana State University. Uh, really? Yeah. yeah. All right, so brother, we're, we, have, we have a kinship there because I got an MFA in theater as well oh. from the University of Washington, a PATP program. Let's go. And that was my path for a while was, this, was about being an actor. Ended Same. up saying, you, you will relate to this. I don't know, man, but I remember doing these three years of, basically acting boot camp and teaching, yes. you know, undergraduate acting and so forth. And 
Yes. Learning a ton about myself. Oh my God. I've never had any workshop better than those three years. And I've had yes. a lot of them. But I remember at the end of one of these plays, I thought, well, I was, I think I was playing, I don't know, Romeo and Romeo and Juliet or something. Yes. And then the audience would leave and then the actors would leave and went, you guys, we have this opportunity. We should sit here and talk about what we just experienced together. Yes. Because the audience has their own perspectives. We, as the actors, have our perspective. What I wanted to do is say, hey, stop. I know you just sat here for three hours, but could we sit down and talk about this? And yes. that's when I realized that my path was more towards facilitation and coaching than it was towards acting. So that's cool that you had this background. I didn't know that. That is awesome. We are definitely <laughs> twin flames. Like, I get you. And I, I get you I played, too. I played Benvolio at Colorado, oh, yeah. <laughs> Colorado Shakespeare Festival. Uh, Which one? Colorado Shakespeare Festival. You were in Colorado Shake? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That is yeah, so I, weird. Were you at, yeah, oh, I, so that's such a beautiful stage. So I was there. I was supposed to. Uh, okay. So long story short, this is a bunch of stuff that you and I will find interesting. Everyone else is going like, all right, guys, moving along. But I remember uh, at the end of my three years with the uh, University of Washington, I got a position to go to Colorado Shake mm -hmm. and to um, play, I thought was the lead role, but it turned out it was an understudy role. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going like, you know, I don't know whether I'm going to hang out doing an understudy role for the whole summer, although it was beautiful there. But Val Kilmer was there at uh -huh. that year. And although I didn't get a chance to meet him, I was thinking like, God, Boulder is so gorgeous. And so that you were able to play there is a big deal. That's one of their top uh, summer stock places in the country. Yes. Good for you, buddy. Yeah, yeah. But that's- So when that's did you where... stop doing acting? And when did, when did acting sort of move into this position in mm -hmm. your life that you're in now? How did that help you get there? You know, it's a crazy story. And I'll give you the cliff notes. Uh, I moved to LA after I graduated. Uh, and um, I got a job um, at Abercrombie and Fitch, standing in front with my shirt off. And um, I got <laughs> you were model. Yes, yeah. I got uh, this uh, manager came in and discovered me, and I got this manager, and I got all these big agents, and the whole thing, and it was going right. And there was this point where uh, I would tell the people I was working, I'm like, ah, oh, my heart keeps doing this funny thing. And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, it just like slows down really slow and then goes up really fast. And somebody finally convinced me to go see a doctor. And when I did, the doctor said, you need to see a cardiologist immediately. And so really? it, became, it became an emergency. And so really? I got to the cardiologist. They ran a bunch of tests over weeks. Um, and one of that, that cardiologist saved my life and really saved millions of lives because my entire life shifted from that point forward. I was never thinking about doing what I'm doing now until right. that moment. So he said, I'm going to give you medicine uh, that will regulate your heartbeat for the rest of your life. You're 25, right? You shouldn't be in here. Right. So here's the other conversation, right? Here's the doctor and here's the human and the dad. The dad in me wants you to look at your diet and wants you to look at your stress levels. And I was 25. I didn't even understand what stress levels meant. I now know that I had been living in hypervigilance since nine years old. Um, and so my body was sending me signals. It, every, a bunch of stuff kept breaking down until we got to the heart. And that's when I went, oh, I'm gonna die if I don't change this. And so mm -hmm. my girlfriend at the time, her mom came and she said, oh my God, Preston, I heard, um, I know you don't read because you're like dyslexic, but I got this mm. book by Jerry and Esther Hicks called Ask and It Is Given. <laughs> and I think you should read it. <laughs> yes, yes. I love this. I love this. Whatever's happening. Yes. Right. This is my actual. Oh my story God. This is just too wild. Right. So she gives me this book and I literally, I was so desperate that I start reading it. And I got like 10 pages in and I dropped the book. And I was like, are you freaking kidding me? Yeah. I have never heard of any of this. This is, you yeah. know, this is 2005. This is not popular. There's no podcast no. on this stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. And that shifted my whole trajectory. I literally <laughs> went 180 and like became a vegan, 
started doing yoga, ayahuasca ceremonies. I'm meditating every day, doing transcendental meditation. I literally flipped the script just to save my Good own for life. You. Yes. Yeah. So that goes back to my first question was, what was the event or events yes. that sort of kind of led you in this direction? It sounds like that was certainly one of them. Definitely. Definitely. So I, I, the reason why I was reacting to your Jerry and Esther Hicks thing is so, again, we were living in Seattle, Washington when we started the business. I went to school up there and then um, had a very short marriage and then came back to Seattle and found my wife. And there's a whole wonderful story about how we were able to, quote unquote, manifest that or find each other. And I remember when I held her hand for the first time, it really literally felt like I had returned home mm. and it felt so familiar, so wonderful. And we're still the best of friends and, and um, she works with me in the business. It sounds like your, your wife's situation as well. Mm -hmm. But so we were in Seattle, I don't know when, how many years ago, this was like 94, you know, long time ago. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we get this, you know, somebody from, from friend, like, let's go listen to these people over at this church or something. Uh -huh. And there was 12 feet people, 15 people in the room. And it was Jerry and Esther Hicks. And we would go to them all the time. We would sort of, we would talk with them during lunch breaks and so forth. And uh, they hadn't written any books at that point. All they had was those cassette tapes back in those days, you know, <laughs> and then you would subscribe to their, you know, their membership and they would send you cassette tapes. That's how you got informed of what was going on. You know, this was way back. And so, of course, fast forward, those who know about them, you know, and of course, Jerry has since passed on. They're a huge draw. You know, you got 10, you got 5,000 people who are showing up for them. And, and they are definitely one of the, um, the leaders in the movement around manifestation. So great. Uh, another synergy here, brother. Uh, the theater and Jerry and Esther, that's incredible. I'm sure there's a probably we'd find another 10, but yep. I've got to hang out with you all the time. If you ever get up here, please look me up. Okay? Yes. Yes. Uh, was, it would love to stay in touch with you. And um, there may be some ways for us to work together. I, I would yes. love to find ways to bring it, your level of energy and light into some of the companies we work with. And uh, I definitely want to follow what you're up to. And um, if I'm ever down in Texas again, which don't have any plans for now, but I really love Austin, we, we should go out and, and get together. It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. Absolutely. When we get stop this, I'm going to take your number down and just shoot. You do. Text. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So this has been a real delight. What a great way to start the uh, 4th of July weekend. We're recording this on the 3rd, by the way, of 2024. You are really a, just a brightening light, a bright, bright shining light. And I just love the fact that you are you, you have this perspective and that you are such an example of the philosophy that you um, subscribe to, because a lot of people out there. Uh, who are so interested in teaching, but they don't necessarily are interested in learning what it is that they're teaching. And um, I really respect and, and I admire for what you're doing. So good work. Thank you, man. I, it means a lot. And for everybody listening, thank you as well. Thank you for your time and your attention. Uh, it's not easy being human and, and you're doing it and you're figuring it out and you're, you're sticking around people like Dean and, and that's a big deal. So I'm just sending you a lot of love wherever you are right now. Wonderful. Well, thanks much.